So let's see if we can simplify the knee joint a little bit. Good morning. Happy Tuesday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. Man, that's really good. So it's Tuesday, always, 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 always a busy day. So we're gonna dig right into today's Q&A. It comes from Mike, and it seems like it's a very simple question, but we're gonna stack some stuff on top of this and make it really interesting. Um, Mike says, can you walk me through the relative motions of the femur and the tibia and how different positions would limit knee flexion and or extension? So he gives a little example of uh, an internally rotated femur on the, the externally rotated tibia. And so, so let's go ahead and talk through this and see if we can simplify this to a certain degree. And then we'll look at some of these, these influences that get superimposed on top of this, this, this knee joint and as to why these things might occur so we can strategize our way out of issues that may arise. Okay, so the one thing that we want to recognize um, is that uh, all joints move on helical angles. And so... Um, what we tend to look at, we tend to look at these things in, in these, these imaginary planar views and it screws things up because we look at the knee as such and we say, oh, it's got this sagittal motion, so we call that flexion extension. And the reality is, is that it's actually turning as it's moving through space. And so as we extend the knee, we want to make sure that we understand that the tibia is externally rotating, <coughs> excuse me, externally rotating relative to the femur. And then as we flex, it's going to internally rotate uh, relative to the femur, okay? And so again, we always talk about two strategies, one plane. The one plane that we wanna talk about is this transverse plane. So this is where, where the, the secret to the knee, I think, I think lies and, and needs to be respected. Um, if we look at resources as far as like how much tibial rotation should we have, if you go to something like Newman's kinesiology book, he'll talk about like a 40 to 45 degree range with a, with a two to one bias of external rotation to internal rotation. So it was more external rotation of the tibia um, relative to the internal. And so if we, if we understand this concept of, of the rotation, then what we want to start to think about is like, okay, so what would be the limitation of, of knee extension? So if I have to have tibial external rotation to, to have normal knee extension, then anything that would limit my ability to externally rotate the tibia then becomes, becomes the restriction to, to, to extension. So it could be something as, as simple as uh, 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 effusion inside the knee. So there's a small amount of fluid accumulation in the knee that would be uh, anterior lateral um, or, or posterior uh, medial would then become a restriction to, to my ability to, to twist the, the tibia into ER. So now I have a lack of extension. So that always has to be a consideration, especially for you folks that, that want to blame the quads for being inhibited in things after a knee surgery. Um, I would be looking towards like some, some measure of effusion in the knee that is keeping that, that quadriceps eccentrically oriented and therefore it would test weak or it would, it would atrophy under those circumstances. So on, in the opposing strategy then, when we talk about tibial IR, if we have an anterior medial or posterior lateral effusion, then we're gonna be lacking knee flexion because I won't be able to internally rotate the, the, the tibia effectively. So think about this for a second. So those of you that are complaining about a posterior lateral knee pain in your deep squat, and you're looking for a structure that, that might be the problem, and I can't rule out that structure is not a problem, but if the knee checks out okay, and you still have that posterior lateral knee pain, what you might be doing is you might be trying to squat with a, a, a tibia that is oriented better towards being an extended knee. So as you squat, you're actually sitting down and you've got a, a, an area of fluid accumulation on the posterior lateral side of the knee that you're trying to sit down on and you're just compressing that and then that results in the discomfort. So. Now let's consider some, some potential influences as far as what might be um, promoting these orientations in the knee that, that seem to be sticking it in, in, a, in a position. And the, the thing that I'm most fond of about talking about knees is I don't think that it's a very intelligent joint, um, to put it mildly. I think it's more responsive to what goes on around it. So now we have to start talking about pelvis orientation. We talk about, about foot orientation. So if the knee's a, a pretty dumb joint, 
and we're gonna pick on this tibia femoral ER. So again, so I got I have a, a, a fixed beam where I'm gonna move it relatively as such. So it's externally rotated. And you say, well, why does this orientation predominate? And so there, so there should be a, like a picture right here so you can kind of see what I'm talking about in a real knee. And this can happen on either side. So I can have I can have this show up on the right knee or I can have it show up on the left knee because what this this orientation is the tibiofemoral ER uh, orientation is is the system looking for internal rotation um, and, and so what we have is a femur that is internally rotated on top of the tibia because I have to apply a force to the ground I have to apply a, pro a propulsive force into the ground so I can stay upright against gravity so I can walk and do all the cool things that, that humans do and so when we think about Embryology, when we think about evolution, external rotation came first. So you were a swimmer before you were a walker, you, you came up on land and you had to figure out a way to put pressure into the ground and that, that is through internal rotation. So again, that is our propulsion. So if I have lost internal rotation anywhere in the system, I will find a strategy that will allow me to do so. And oftentimes what we'll see is this tibiofemoral ER strategy we're gonna turn the, the femur inward into internal rotation to create our downward force. So when we see terms like knee valgus, or we see situations of, of hyperextension of the knee, what we're actually talking about is we're talking about somebody that's utilizing an internal rotation strategy because that's what the resultant is going to be. So we don't really have a hyperextension. What we have is, is a lot of internal rotation of the femur on top of the tibia. When we have the valgus, what we have is a change in the center of gravity to an anterior medial strategy, and then that twists the femur inward, turns the, the tibia outward, and we will put pressure down and forward into the ground. And so we have to do that through, through the knee. So the elephant in the room then becomes this pelvic orientation situation. And so an anterior orientation of the pelvis is, is me looking for an internal rotation strategy. That's why we lose external rotation of the hip when the pelvis anteriorly orients uh, because I'm looking for more internal rotation and I have to sacrifice my ability to externally rotate. So this is why hip extension activities then become very, very important when we're talking about restoring normal knee excursion because I have to establish my external rotations first so I can delay propulsion and then recapture internal rotation. If we go all the way down to the foot, now we're talking about a situation where I might have a foot that's following that tibia into external rotation. Under those circumstances, I'll have an early propulsive foot. That means that I'm going to have an externally rotated foot. I've lost internal rotation at the ankle and foot. Internal rotation at the ankle and foot is represented by my ability to dorsiflex and pronate. And so if I lose that strategy, now I'm going to have to recapture that. So, so my goal then is to retrain my tibia to be able to move through the full excursion of middle propulsion. And that's where I recapture that dorsiflexion and nicely I capture internal rotation all the way up the chain into the hip assuming I have managed that pelvic orientation. So the bottom line here, Mike, is we have to stop looking at the knee as some sort of hinge, hinge joint. We have to respect the fact that it turns as it moves. And so measurements like heel to butt flexion become hugely important because it represents my ability to internally rotate that tibia fully. Capturing my, my five to 10 degrees of knee hyperextension by definition in the textbooks is my representation of my ability to recapture the external rotation of the tibia. So now we have a really, really simple way to look at this knee. If I don't have those excursions, I don't care about anything else about that knee until I can recapture those things because they represent the, the, the um, normal representation of what my knee should be capable of. So reestablish ER, reestablish IR on top of the ER, get your dorsiflexion back and you're going to save your knees a world of hurt. I hope that's helpful. Everybody have a fabulous Tuesday and I'll see you tomorrow.